All right. All right. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Yuan Chen uh, to give his uh, dissertation uh, thesis defense talk. Um, you know, I I had absolutely no idea when I first met Yuan Chen um, uh, at the biophysics recruitment center and had a, a conversation with this very excited young kid interested in bringing machine learning into computational chemistry that. All right, uh, here we go. How about now? How about so, now? You can hear us now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is good. All right. So um, I, I, I was saying I, I had absolutely no idea that Yanchin would actually change practice uh, so so drastically within our field. So, um, you know, I, I have to credit Yanchin with not only bringing great new ideas, but having the patience to learn 40 years worth of ridiculous history of how things evolved in our field of computational chemistry and why things are as they are, often because it was fine on a PDP-11 um, in 19... 70s and 80s. Um, but now we have more powerful computers. And I think that's really updating the way we think about how to approach a lot of the problems in our field, as he'll tell you about today, uh, is really a refreshing and, and very forward perspective. Um, and that's going to open up a lot of avenues. So, you know, there's been a huge industry interest in what Yuan Ching has already put together, and it's become the foundation for large efforts like the Open Force Field Initiative, which has dozens of industry partners that, that support it. Uh, and so, you know, the I, again, I, I'm just incredibly impressed by how much impact uh, he, he will have in our field and he has had to date. And I'm super thrilled that he's now going to be a fellow, a Simons fellow, uh, independent fellow at uh, NYU Chemistry, working in collaboration with some great folks there, but continuing to collaborate in these areas with us as well. Uh, and very much looking forward about you telling the world about uh, what you've done. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much for the uh, warm introduction. And yeah. <laughs> And uh, thanks everybody for coming here. Uh, I know many of you have heard this talk more than 10 times. Uh, <laughs> apologies uh, if, if this is bore you. Uh, I guess before I officially start, I'll just uh, say a few words. Uh, of course, uh, this thesis, if you have read it, is dedicated to my late grandfather, who was a naval engineer with the communists. And when, when I was a little kid, he used to give me radios and bikes and whatnot to disassemble and to reassemble against that's what my first science and engineering experience was. And that's perhaps what uh, influenced me and shaped my decision to, to take on this uh, exhausting, but also mesmerizing career. So um, thank you, Grandpa, if you are here, there or wherever you are, uh, this is all your fault. So uh, apart from my late grandfather, I would also like to thank uh, a number of people around me during my uh, thesis. So first and foremost, my thesis advisor, uh, John Codera. Um, I still remember the first day I visited the lab uh, when you sprinted from one meeting room to, to meet me and show me around uh, the robot. And back then, back then, I know absolutely nothing about how any of uh, these cool stuff works. And you still uh, accepted me and led me into the uh, entrance to the labor of computational biophysics and gave me the freedom to explore. And your insistence on scientific rigor and presentation clarity, towards which I might have shown a slight uh, sign of uh, content, uh, protest once or twice, is what shaped me most as a scientist, if I shall call myself that. So if one day my dream of becoming a PI at one of the institutions ever came true, I would want to be a leader just like you. Um, and likewise, I thank all of my thesis committee members for all your guidance, support, and steering. And um, thank you, all of my lovely Codera Lab uh, colleagues. To me, you're really more than just colleagues. And truly, this is what made uh, commuting here from another state uh, <laughs> enjoyable and uh, enjoyable. And on the personal side, of course, I thank my parents for supporting me um, and, and don't care what I choose with my career. You are the best Asian parents that I ever know of. <laughs> uh, I also thank my partner, Ziqing, who uh, might be another meeting, but who might join at any minute. I, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> without you, I could have done this much quicker, uh, but now without losing my sanity. All right. So, so with that, I, I guess I'm about to actually start. So, this movie you are seeing right here uh, is actually, to the best of our knowledge, the first simulation with the unified ligand and protein force field, but more on that later. So, oh, before I actually start the science part, I guess I'm going to tell you a few things about myself. So I grew up in a city called Nanjing, China, 
And this is my favorite place in the city. It's a, it's a bookstore called Library Avant Garde. Uh, it's a car park converted bookstore, which is a metaphor, a joke, signifying that the Chinese intellectuals are going to the underground. Uh, it, it, some critics say that this is one of the best bookstores uh, in the whole world. Uh, so highly recommend that you visit if you ever found yourself in that corner of the, the world. So I spent numerous afternoons here as a student just reading uh, books uh, imported or smuggled rather from Hong Kong and Taiwan. Uh, but now if you visit, of course, we'll see some very different books, which can be seen as a manifest or even an epiphany of, of the, the joke. So from, from uh, Nanjing, I then went to Sichuan University, uh, named after the sauce, to get a uh, uh, chemistry, chemistry degree. And I got another bachelor's degree in comparative literature in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then I moved to New York, a city I never ever want to leave. Uh, although currently I live in New Jersey, but that's a year out. To get a MFA in creative writing with uh, Mark J. Mursky, and uh, while well, I was pursuing my PhD here at Nicholas von Kettering. And after this, well, if I, if I, if you guys let me pass, I'm going to move on to NYU as an independent fellow, uh, continuing to work on pretty much what I'm working on right now. So uh, that'd be fun. When I was in Michigan, I spent some of my best time in my life working in this building situated on 1600 Huron Parkway in the lovely city of Ann Arbor, Michigan. So it used to be a Pfizer building where the first floor is chemistry labs, the second floor biology labs, and the third floor uh, uh, executive offices. So the compounds would be synthesized on the first floor, characterized on the second, and then its fate are gonna be determined on the third floor where people are going to look at the data and look at the structure of the molecule and make decisions regarding whether some variants of this molecule should be continued uh, to pursue or they should abandon this entire thing. And of course, uh, as John used to put it, uh, what happened in these meeting rooms are really people just looking at molecules and talking about their feelings about the molecules. So there are no qualitative ways, um, sorry, quantitative ways to characterize optimality or the lack thereof uh, regarding any, any of these decisions. So this is partly why drug discovery is such a expensive and risky sport. It takes uh, millions of dollars and more than a decade to go from scratch to a uh, new chemical entity on average. On the cold windy morning of uh, December 1st, 2007, Pfizer found that uh, its campaign on um, Tocetropip, which was supposed to be a a cholesterol modifying drug was a total disaster. Total disaster, and because of the uh, cuts in their in their uh, cash chain, they had to close down this entire uh, Midwest headquarters and sold the entire building to University of Michigan. So we kept all of its layout of its chemistry labs, biology labs, and offices. But perhaps to alleviate that um, that that symptom, that the optimality. They also stuff a team of computational chemists into the basement where there are no windows at all, but many coffee machines. Uh, but to be more exact, actually two computational teams, one is structure based and the other is ligand based, and they do drastically different things and they never talk to each other. So the structure based team, they do things like MD simulation or docking and uh, they, they look at the, the structure of the protein and how they interact with uh, small molecules. Whereas the ligand-based teams, they look at uh, the, the topology of the ligand and they construct what they call quantitative structure activity relationship model or QSAR model. So the, the, the issue here is that there is no mutual information at all between these two, two teams. They don't talk to each other. There's a very wide hallway separating them. So the ligand-based team, they cannot incorporate any structural insights into their model and the structure-based team, even if they have data, they cannot feed the data back into their model. So the simulation is simulation, even if it doesn't make sense. So uh, when I started my PhD career, I, I want to change this. I want to sort of bridge the gap between the structural and uh, uh, physical side of uh, biomolecular modeling. And to be more specific, I want to focus on this, this area uh, that we call force field. So what is a force field? So uh, the dream of biophysicists, for at least computational biophysicists, is to sample such a distribution, a Boltzmann-like distribution, where the target density is, uh, is proportional to the exponential nature of the negative energy. Uh, if you have access to such distribution, then you can 
you can characterize very well the energy landscape of a system, then you know what the protein and the ligand is doing, right? But of course, we cannot get access to this object. So rather, we compromise and we come up with a, a surrogate thing, which we call U hat, uh, conditioned on some parameters. So this is a parameterized object that we, so we call this thing a force field, just to parameterize the mapping from the geometry of a state of a system to a scalar, which we call energy. So no matter what kind of a divergence metric you use, you all realize that if you, your U and U hat are closer to each other, your P and Q are gonna be closer to each other uh, as well. So we are interested in finding a way to prompterize such, uh, such objects so that we get closer to the true energy of some physical systems. However, biophysicists, we, we are, or they are, uh, I guess I can say we, we are uh, good at uh, sampling a system accurately or efficiently, but never both. So molecular mechanics is a class of force field that's very fast, very interpretable. They have this very cute abstractions. So say things like residues, helix, the chemical bonds, which don't, don't actually exist. Uh, but on the other hand, we have this uh, very accurate, very reliable, but also prohibitively slow quantum mechanics uh, force field. So machine learning force field strive to sort of approach the balance between accuracy and speed. So we want to get the lollipop so the dream is to get some force field that's as fast as the MM, but as accurate or reliable as QM. Currently, although we're trying to get to that corner, the reality is that the state of the art machine learning potential is sort of here, where it's in terms of accuracy, it's pretty good. It's beyond uh, one kicker mole threshold, which people call quantum uh, chemical accuracy, the, the heuristic threshold beyond which it's okay, or it's reasonable to say that we can approximate the qualitative behavior of a system pretty reliably. However, although it's by magnitude faster than, than QM, it's still a hundred per thousand times slower than MM. So in this thesis, uh, we try to get the lollipop from two angles. One is to make state of the art machine learning potentials faster, and the other is to make current molecular mechanics force field uh, more accurate. So how should we do that? Let me introduce you the uh, first approach that we took to, to sort of improve the current uh, MM traditional force field. So what is the MM force field? Um, there are a bunch of notations flying around here, but if we were to summarize this, we can think of this as two things going to the equation. The first is the geometry of your system or some quantities can compute it uh, from the geometry. For example, if it's a chemical bond, then we compute a bond length. If you have an angle, then we can compute an angle value. And the other set is just uh, some parameters that we use in those polynomials. So we model all of the chemical bonds as a harmonic uh, spring. And how strong is the spring? What is its uh, equivariant, oh, I'm sorry, equilibrium uh, bond length, et cetera. This is all considered as part of the parameters. So we put this uh, X geometry and VFF parameters together and stick them into this very sophisticated functional form and we will get, uh, get a number that we call energy. But if you take a closer look at these functional forms, you'll realize that many, many times we're just simplifying things. So bonds are all harmonic, it's, it's just the spring and angles are harmonic as well. So they have a, a equilibrium angle and any deviation from that will have a, a, a harmonic a penalty or harmonic energy. So it's almost like a, a grip trainer, whereas the torsion terms are almost like a, a twist trainer where it's just a few uh, Fourier series. So th this is of course quite ridiculous, but it also has its beauty. So everything is either local or pairwise, meaning that the entire functional form is gonna scale linear, uh, the, the runtime is gonna scale linearly with regard to the size of the system which would make uh, it very fast and to make the simulation of a large system feasible. So uh, before we try to revolutionize the functional forms, we want to ask ourselves, have we really pressed all of the juice out of these functional forms? If we kept these uh, functional forms, it would be possible that if we change the parameterization of these functional forms, we can get a better force field. But before we do that, let's look at how people uh, currently parameterize these. So this is what you get uh, if, you, if you click inside uh, open force field. 
you'll see this XML files where uh, all the harmonic bond forces are defined as, in a dictionary as the combination of two atom types into a bond type. And you have you stick a length and a K, which is the force constant to that chemical bond. And the similar story happens for angles and torsions and et cetera. So, but even what's uh, more horrible is, is uh, the definition of these atom types, these uh, type one equals OW, HWBR, these kind of stuff. These are determined by an actual table that people publish in an actual paper that can print out. So can you imagine in 21st century, you have a group of uh, chemical informaticians, they will look at a paper and they key in the definition of, of these uh, atom types. So for example, this is one of the most popular atom typing table uh, in GAF. So, uh, well, that's just in terms of uh, beautiful and ugly, but what's the actual limitation here is that if you look at these two molecules, they will have the same atom type because they're all aromatic carbon, although they must have drastically different chemical environments. So this is something that will keep um, chemists awake at night. So uh, how can we change this? Uh, by the way, it's worth mentioning that if you wanted to optimize the force field, the optimization of the parameter itself is already uh, feasible. We can just do a gradient descent thing. But to optimize the, the actual atom typing scheme is difficult. So to change this thing, we have to know this thing better. We have to look at what are being considered in this table. So uh, if you read it a little closely, you'll see that all the attributes marked in red are atom attributes. So it's something that's associated with the atom. So what element it is, what hybridization, aromatism, uh, aromaticity, uh, everything marked in red is just the nature of the atom. Everything marked in blue is the nature of the atom's neighbor. Right? So what kind of uh, uh, atom you are, you are uh, bonding with. And everything marked in green are the number of, of neighbors. So three things are being considered. Now we're going to translate from the chemical chemo informatics set of language to graph uh, theory set of language. So we call these three things also node attribute because we, if you model uh, molecules as graphs, then all of your atoms are usually nodes. And uh, neighbors, which is just bond, bonded atoms. So node attribute, number of neighbors, and uh, neighbor attributes. These are the only things to consider in a atom typing table. So we also abstract the last two attributes as the neighborhood multiset, which is just uh, the how many and what of uh, neighbors. So if magically you have a function that can replace atom typing scheme, then at least it should have the same functional signature as the traditional legacy atom typing scheme. And in this case, it would be a function that map from a uh, node attribute and the neighborhood multiset to some representation, because atom typing scheme, the legacy atom typing scheme also produced such a representation, although in this case, it's just an integer, it's a, it's a, it's a category, some very low resolution representation, but the representation nonetheless. So we can write this thing in such a form where the row is just the aggregation functions of uh, that acts on the uh, NV, which is the neighborhood of the node, whereas HV is the representation of the node itself. So if you write it in such a form, you realize that this is just the master equation of uh, graph neural networks. Neural network has exactly the same uh, functional signature as a legacy atom typing scheme. So it's it's very nat natural for us to uh, oops, to hypothesize that G GNS are at least as expressive as uh, atom typing schemes because, well, they have the same signature, but they just produce a higher resolution representation. But we don't have a theoretical way to prove this because nobody can characterize theoretically uh, what a atom typing table is capable of. It, it's rather uh, messy and heuristic. So we did this experimentally. We just took a vanilla GNN and we trained it on um, uh, some chemoinformatic chemo toolkit assigned atom types. And we tried to reproduce the atom types. And it seems that on the test set and how to test set, we can approach or we can achieve over 99% of agreement, meaning that at least ex experimentally, we have at least the same capacity as a traditional uh, atom typing 
scheme. So having achieved that, we now wonder what if we grab those GNN generated embeddings and we pull them together so that we can have embeddings for bonds, angles, and torsions, and we use those objects to produce your force field parameters. So we design this, this pipeline, uh, which we call uh, end to end, uh, which we call extensible surrogate potential optimized by message passing or SPLOMA, where we take a GNN, we produce the atom representations, we combine them, which we're going to talk about uh, in a bit, to form representations for bonds, angles, and, and torsions. And then we use those representations to get the angle, bond, and torsion parameters. And know that once you have the, know two things. First, this entire thing is end-to-end -end differentiable. The FFF, the collection of FFF is differentiable with regard to your uh, GNN parameters. And your energy too is differentiable with regard to your GNN parameters. And of course, energy is also the geometry so that you can, uh, you can just take the, 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 the energy and take gradients to either the parameters or the, the coordinates. And another beautiful thing about this is that all of the colorful arrows only need to be uh, executed once in, for one system. Once you have your GNN, once you have your representations and the parameters, the FFF to energy arrow is as fast as your traditional uh, MM force field. So you can just sample this thing. You can just do inference on this thing in a, in a uh, traditional MM framework, namely OpenFF. It's exactly as fast. Okay, so, so this work uh, has been accepted into uh, chemical science and picked as the uh, front cover article. So for, for the, the picture, I asked the artist, which uh, is not, a, not a cheap, to produce an artwork on a, a robotic hands, a pair of robotic hands, either assigning parameters to ethanol molecule or shaking a highly effervescent uh, uh, paloma. Uh, of course, I, I know paloma should never be shaken, but you get the idea. So uh, let's go back to this uh, framework and, and take a look, take a closer look at how we assign parameters to bonds, angles, and torsions. So let's return to the table where, uh, where they by hand coded all of the, the bond types and bond parameters and see what's happening here. So they consider the uh, type one, which is the, the atom typing of the first atom and type two, which is the atom typing of the second atom and they use the dictionary lookup. Oh, we know that, of course, neural networks, even one layer is uh, as capable as it, or is capable of dictionary lookup. Um, the only thing that, that is worth noting here is that you will not find another bond type with type two equals OW and type one uh, equals HW because it's order invariant. If you switch the order of your first and second uh, atoms, the representation and thereby the parameter should stay the same. And of course, because the indexing are arbitrary. Now, one of the, the silliest, but one of the most expressive way to achieve this invariance would be to use something called Chanusi pooling. Uh, this is getting more and more popular in recent months, but uh, the, the idea is very simple. If you have, a, if you have an invariance that you want to uh, respect, the simp simplest thing to do would be to enumerate all of the permutations that you care about and push them through a non-invariant neural network and then average or sum your representations. So in our case, this is a tremendously easy except for the uh, improper torsions, of course. Uh, but for everything else, all the bonded terms here, it's just a it's just the mirror symmetry, right? So for your chemical bond, as long as you have zero, one, and one, zero, and you push them through the same neural network, and then you average them, that's already uh, invariant because you only care about the, the mirror symmetry here. So that, that just completes what happens. Oh, I'm so sorry. Jesus. Uh, no, probably just here. So, uh, so sorry. Uh, you have to connect the cable again for some uh, the cable, the HDMI or? Yeah, there we go. Oh, I would be more than happy to take any questions from you. Okay. If, okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, but, but seriously, if I have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, yeah, so so that completes the, the, the pipeline. Now it's time for us to test the pipeline. 
but, but before we want to make a surrogate potential of QM, we want to first make sure that this thing actually works, right? So the uh, atom typing recovery rate thing is just a, a smoke test or a sanity check. And we need another sanity check, not just for GNM part, but also for the downstream parameterization part. So what we did is that uh, we took a legacy force build and we generated a bunch of snapshots and we take the energies and we only look at energies that use S Paloma to reproduce all of the parameters. So it turned out that if we fit the S Paloma framework onto the set of coordinates and energies, we can not only reproduce uh, all of the total energies almost exactly correct, but also the energy terms, the bonded, bond energy, the angle energy, as well as all of the the parameters that's dictating the entire energy landscape. So it is reasonable to say, although this is not a theoretical statement, that we are we might be somewhere close in terms of uh, FS parameter to the maximum likelihood fit uh, on this data. So it, it's also reasonable to, to expect that if we replaced everything here from MM data to actual QM data, we might also be able to find something that looked like a um, MLE fit for, for that uh, data set. So this is what we did. So we, we pulled a bunch of uh, data sets, QM data sets from uh, uh, QC archive, which is a uh, open source platform where you can upload your molecules and they run QM for you. The reason why we didn't try it on any of the big uh, standard benchmark set is that all of those data that either they stand for high energy regions, which are not interesting to MM, or they simply don't have the topology in, uh, annotated. Whereas topology is something, is a, is a notion that we have to keep uh, in the MM setting. So um, by just at the first glance, you will see that Espeloma outperforms all of the uh, legacy force code by a margin. Uh, but if you break these down, you will see some uh, rather more interesting story here. So the first data set, the Falcato data set, is just some simple uh, CHO compounds. It's a low complexity, limited chemical space that doesn't uh, pose too, too much challenge. You would want to use this as another sanity check. And after this, we took a bunch of uh, drug-like molecules from open FS Gen 2 optimization data set. Oh, I should also mention that all of the data sets here are optimization data sets, meaning that they, they start from some, some, uh, some confirmation and use QM to, to optimize the energy so that they end up with a low energy uh, confirmation. So the open, um, open FF Gen 2 optimization data set, again, we can uh, outperform all of the uh, legacy force field, it's, it's particularly interesting that even open FF 1.2.0, which was trend on this entire, uh, this very data set cannot uh, achieve our performance, showcasing that perhaps it's, it's a functional uh, superiority rather than a data superiority. And then we move on to this more interesting region of heterocyclic uh, compounds. So in this case, uh, it's a bunch of heterocyclic rings that experts say might be of importance uh, in the next 10, 15 years for drug discovery. As you can see, we did okay, whereas all of the legacy force field failed horribly. So, so what is happening here? We took the molecule with the largest RMSE and analyzed the optimization uh, trajectory. So this is the molecule, I have no idea how to name this, but this is the molecule with the largest RMSE for OpenFF and GAF both one and two in this data set. So at first glance, you might think it's uh, aromatic, but it's actually not if you uh, count the number of electrons or, or just look at that there's no even conjugated system. However, because of the limited resolution of legacy force field, all of the legacy force field thought that this was a aromatic uh, compound. So when we start as a, a flat confirmation and we optimize USQM, because it's not actually uh, aromatic, all of the nitrogens here will be become parametral, whereas the parametral nitrogens will be assigned a very high energy for uh, in all of your, your MM uh, force field. As Paloma, however, because we, we have seen similar data set, uh, data points in training set, we've realized that A, this is not aromatic, and B, we're able to approximate the energy landscape more closely. 
And then we move, move on to peptides. So we uh, trained another model on this dye and tri peptides in PepConf dataset. And again, uh, we, we achieved uh, uh, outstanding uh, or at least competi uh, competitive performance when compared with uh, OpenFF and GAF, and even when compared with Amber, which is the state, uh, this the force field that everybody uses for protein modeling. And finally, here comes the uh, the video you have been seeing uh, in the first slide, which is a uh, which is the the force field resulted from training a Espeloma model on both the drug-like data uh, chemical space as well as the di and tripeptide. Note that because Espeloma is a graph-based model and that's very local, so it wouldn't know what, whether uh, it's a, it's a small peptide or a large peptide. That's it's uh, by its inductive bias is generalizable. So we can generalize from small peptide to large peptide or to the even the entire protein. And for protein ligand uh, joint simulation previously, it's never been done before because they use this template-based system. It's gonna look at these residues uh, and for ligand, it's gonna look at these uh, ridiculous atom types. So there is no, no generalizable unifying uh, force field. But, Espeloma treats everything as just a small or large graph or even a disconnected graph that can be partitioned into two. So Espeloma has no problem parameterizing this at all. Uh, and we see that this can result in a very stable uh, simulation. This is, the, this is basically the displacement uh, of the uh, ligand. And you can see that qualitatively it stays pretty much similar uh, to the profile of GAF or OpenFF. So this also opens up the door of many other opportunities so for example, covalent addict. This has been a, a headache for uh, simulation community for a long time, because again, people don't have a unified protein ligand force field. So they wouldn't know what to uh, assign uh, the atoms in the, in the bridging region. So again, Espeloma just treats them as a larger graph. That's a addict of two small graphs. So here, I'm sorry, this is of, horrible quality, but uh, trust me, if you zoom in this, you will see that uh, all of the atoms that are far away from the bridge, they have the same parameters as if they were to assign uh, separately, whereas the bridging regions, they would have perturbed parameters, which more or less correspond to our understanding of the system. And you can not only run simulations, but also to carry out uh, free energy calculations using Espeloma. So here we treated, because of some engineering uh, bottleneck, we treated the protein still with the with amber force field and tetra-3P water, but only the ligand region with uh, Espeloma uh, force field. And as you can see here, we can already have an improvement in predicting the uh, binary free energy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the experimental values. We have a higher correlation, we have a, a lower deviation. So uh, we are still, we're still trying to to expand the, this work so that we incorporate a larger uh, chemical space that people can actually use uh, Espeloma in their work in sampling the conformational space of uh, diverse uh, compounds and, and proteins. But we're also interested in further making the, the performance even better by taking the derivative of the free energy era with regard to the force field parameter and thereby with regard to the uh, neural network parameters. But that, that is in uh, future work. So uh, when the paper got out, a lot of people were interested in a specific component of Espeloma, which is the charge assignment, because I understand it's very hard to change the practice of the field in one night, but there are incremental changes that people can incorporate in their workflow. Charge assignment, for example, it has been a um, so charge or charges are super critical parameters in their uh, MM simulation because it's considered to be static, although it's not uh, throughout the simulation. And people use a set of fixed uh, point charges as the, the, the atomic charges throughout the simulation. So charges are really shaping the energy landscape, especially for the uh, intramolecular part, uh, intermolecular part. So uh, Espeloma simultaneously predicted charge, but he separated this, this module and uh, provided this, this as, a, as another bucket uh, that's installable to the community. So the diagram here is, is pretty much the same as the, the big Espeloma package, but we've just focused on the charges. 
And there's one tiny trick here. So there's one thing that's different in charge assignment compared to all other force field parameter assignment is that we have to obey these uh, total charge constraint exactly. So all of your partial atomic charge, they have to add up to the total charge um, exactly, which could be positive, negative, or, or zero. And neural networks don't, don't really like that. You have to come up with some uh, clever trick to, to overcome that. And what we did, did here is that we predict the first and second order derivative of the charging potential energy with regard to the uh, atom charges, uh, which is the which is what chemists call uh, harness uh, S and uh, electronegativity E here. And then we can combine uh, these and just to minimize the charging uh, potential energy. This is the trick done uh, by Gilson et al. Uh, about 10 years ago. But they used a, for, again, a table based uh, approach for atom types, whereas we replace everything uh, with GNN. So we use GNNs to predict free form uh, E's and S or harness and electron activity. And then we go through this optimization, which has an analytical solution to get a constraint. Uh, solution for for the of the charges that obey the constraint uh, exactly. So um, uh, it's it's still being being um, it's still being revised to to actually submit. But here's a uh, here's the a quick peek at it, just the preprint. So overall, we have comparable performance when it comes to the uh, discrepancy between predicted charge and reference charge. So we don't know what the reference charge is because A1PCC itself, which is the framework that people use to assign uh, atom charges, is already a heuristic. So people think that two different kind of implementations of A1PCC in two separate packages are so, sort of the acceptable error. And our discrepancy with regard to one implementation is actually many, in many cases smaller than that discrepancy. So I guess you can say that we the error is, if not uh, negligible, at least acceptable by the com community. And then you break down the error. And you can see that S Paloma charge did better when there are abundant data. So if you break down the, uh, the data set by the total charge or by the molecule size, you will see that uh, we have a better performance when in the, for the neutral molecules or molecules uh, with not too large, not too small sizes, which again, I guess is just the nature of uh, machine learning surrogate methods. And uh, although we do not have a sense of what the values, what the deviation actually means, because again, MPCC itself is just a heuristic, we can incorporate these charges into uh, some MD simulations. So here is just using MD simulation for uh, uh, for hydrogen free energy uh, calculation. And when you switch to from your per, your favorite tool to S Paloma charge, you can see that there are no sig uh, statistically significant change in the correlation with regard to experimental data at all. So I guess you can uh, sort of plug and play and replace uh, your 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 current. Uh, Amber or OpenEye tool with S Paloma charge. But why would you do that? Because those toolkits are tremendously slow. Even on PCC, although it's a heuristic itself, it is still a semi empirical method. So it scales square uh, with regard to the size of the system, whereas we are GNN based, so we scale linearly with regard to the size of the system. So with S Paloma charge, you can prompt trace a 100 residue protein in less than a second, even on CPU. So uh, this would lift a bottleneck in many uh, workflows. And it's it's very easy to, to install. You can just pip install that and you can incorporate this into your uh, workflow easily. So uh, that's about one, one angle, which is to make uh, MM uh, more accurate and I guess uh, well, this work, although although I, I think there will be some utility in making MM uh, more, more applicable to larger chemical spaces and to model systems more accurately, but there are also rumors out there saying that MM might just disappear in like 20, 30 years because we have uh, machine learning potentials which are getting faster and faster. 
But I believe that on this design space, what people are actually looking for is not separated between MM or, or, or ML. It's going to be a continuous spectrum where we're going to take functional forms from, from MM and some ML potentials, and we find uh, the perfect mixture of them. So in another work, uh, I'm going to very briefly introduce how uh, in, in a, another chapter of my thesis, we make ML potentials significantly faster. So uh, that, that work uh, is called SACA or state uh, spatial attention uh, kinetic network with equivariance. Okay, so speaking of variance, let me just briefly introduce the uh, concept of, of invariant and equivariant features. So if you have a, a group and you have two transformations uh, that belongs to the group, and here is the S and the G, so for example, for the simplicity, you can just think about our rotations. So we call a, uh, a function phi uh, invariant if you apply this, this transformation and your output stays the same. And we call it equivariant. If you apply this and then you transform, we can find another function on a corresponding space where if you apply the transform first and the, trans uh, the transform first and the function phi, then you will have the same answer. So, for example, if your transformation is the, the rotation, then on the three dimensional space, your equivariant features could include uh, your position. Uh, on on SO3 group, your equivariant feature might include the velocity and, and acceleration, whereas your invariance features might include the, the embedding of your atoms and molecules, the energy of your uh, state and atomic and molecular properties. So previously, all of the state-of-the-art machine learning potentials have been using what's shown on the left, uh, this group of uh, spatial harmonics and the com composition thereof to represent the transformations that are, uh, that are equivariant uh, or, or the representations that will be equivariant with regard to uh, transformations in SO3 group. But uh, this is, of course, extremely expensive. So what we found in this paper is that if you just take a set of uh, edge vectors and linearly combine them with some neural network determined coefficients, and then you take the norm of all of these uh, linear combinations, and the result will be universally approximated. So you take this, the output of this uh, fun function um, uh, equation six, and this output will, will be able to describe anything, including uh, some projected uh, spherical harmonics. So in other words, you don't need any of these higher order spherical harmonics. You just need your edge vectors and you just need to find out a way to cleverly uh, combine them. So we tested this on a bunch of very boring benchmark systems. They are of no uh, actual value whatsoever because they're toy systems. But it's, it's sort of the pathology uh, in machine learning field where we just benchmark models on, on small data sets and claim to them to be useful, but it's, it's the first step nonetheless. We're expanding this to a uh, larger data set um, and test it there instead. But on these tiny, tiny toy sets, uh, one trend you can see is that our performance is, comparative, uh, is comparable with the state of the art, which is usually the, the NEQIP model, which uh, use a lot of these higher order uh, spherical harmonics trans, uh, transformations and compositions. But our inference time is five to 100 times faster than, uh, than, than equip. So this is something that you can actually use to, to sample your, your system with. And what's also interesting about this thing is that because this universal approximated uh, properties you can also use the invariant features to, to populate or to populate the, the coefficients of your equivariant features and predict not just scalar fields, but also vectors. So for example, we can use this neural network to predict um, the time evolution of a, of a simulation even before the simulation starts. So on the left, uh, we have a, another tiny system where it's just a few charged particles and they're interacting with each other uh, via Coulomb force, uh, and we take the initial uh, velocity and position, and we predict its position at a given uh, timestamp, and we are 
pretty good at that. And we also take this just for, for a better understanding, we also take this to a, a microscopic system where we take the initial velocity and position of a walking person and predict uh, its, its position at a uh, given time. And we are pretty successful with that as well. Okay, uh, so, so I guess I've introduced two, two aspects of, of uh, my uh, thesis. One is to make MM more accurate via Espaloma, and the other is make state-of-the-art machine learning potential faster uh, via Sake. But of, of course, there are lots, a lot more things needs to be done to make a, to achieve the lollipop, to make a force field that's at almost, that's, that's, Put the word there almost as fast as a as a, a MM potential and almost as accurate as a QM potential. So if we had that model, what what is going to look like? So on the one hand, you have this topology issue for something like Espeloma or any kind of MM force field. You need to hard code your topology. You need to define your bonds, angles, torsions, um, and your residues, of course. This, of course, has two benefits. First is that it's going to be more uh, regularized. So you know how the, there, there are a lot more inductive biases encoded to your model. You know how your models should perform. So for example, if you stretch a bond, it's going to go to infinite energy. So maybe don't stretch it to the sampler or know to constrain the bond in a, uh, in a certain region. But on the other hand, does that is that inductive bias physical? We know it's not. If you stretch a bond, the bond is going to break. For something like sake, it doesn't require topology at all, so it doesn't. It's not constrained to to some specific region, which is good and bad. It's good because it can approximate a much more uh, detailed energy landscape, and it can encode um, whatever scenario you wish, given that you have data, uh, but. In the data scarce region, you will be very uh, ignorant uh, in terms of the energy prediction. And also just practically, uh, many of you who have run MD simulation will know that more than perhaps 50% of the time on a system is spent on defining the topology and refining the topology. If you use a ML, potentially you don't need the topology because we know the bonds and angles and torsion and the helixes and the residues, all of that are, uh, are, are non-existent, they're just our imagination. So what would what the perfect model look like? One possibility would be to only constrain the key uh, geometry where treat other interactions classically. So this has been done is, uh, in this one at all 2022 paper where they can run ML, uh, MM simulations with uh, some bonds constructed or some other bonds just inferred. Okay, the next aspect of this is the frequency of uh, message passing. This will have a direct impact on the uh, speed of the model. So Espeloma do message passing only once and fix the system and you can just simulate uh, for however long without ever re parameterize This is of course very fast, but it also means that we assume that we have a same chemical species throughout the system, which could change. Right. Uh, well, recently people have been looking at somewhere in between the space where if we do a message passing once in a while to to update the change in the uh, in the in the landscape, whereas keeping that uh, static in, in most steps, that's also another uh, possibility. And uh, functional forms, traditional and then functional forms are simple, elegant, and interpretable. They're bonds and angles and will not, whereas ML potentials are very black boxy. So can we use something that's slightly more expressive than traditional MM uh, functional forms, but more interpretable uh, than black boxy machine learning potentials? And one possibility would be this class two for the field, where it adds a bit of coupling between bonds and angles and bond angle coupling and bond torsion uh, coupling and torsion angle coupling. So that would keep your Runtime complexity is still linear while greatly uh, enhancing the expressiveness. Now we have to start to have the tools to, to do this. So uh, we're in the process of migrating 
the uh, Esplomo framework into uh, the JAX uh, ecosystem so that we have the, uh, the infrastructure to play with all of these ideas. Okay, so uh, lastly, I'm just gonna briefly touch some of the future directions. So one thing that you might have been noticing is that all of my work has been uh, based on graph neural networks or to be more specific message passing graph neural networks. There are spatial graph neural networks that just aggregate information from neighborhoods. Uh, and we pretty much took that as granted. Like every computational chemist who work on these graph models, they use message passing GNNs. But are the are they the best GNS out there to use? So uh, in my future uh, study, well, this is not just saying because we're actually gonna uh, look at this. We want to design a class of GNS for, by, and of the, the chemist. So what would that look like? But there are a bunch of original things of message passing graph neural networks. One of them is that because you're do, doing a lot of rounds of these, uh, graph convolution, which is just averaging, you average, 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 so that your, your information is gonna get be embedded in a smaller and smaller dimensionality. So this is what they call a, a over scratching problem. And you cannot get the detailed information from your, uh, from your neighbor if they are a few steps uh, away from you. And as a result of this iterative averaging, you also have this over smoothing problem where your node becomes more and more similar. So it doesn't matter what flavor of GNA you use as long as you're doing convolution at infinite number of steps, you're gonna have all of your node representation laying a very narrow arc uh, on the subspace. So they don't differentiate uh, that well. And this is sort of okay in social uh, modeling context where people rely on this assumption of homophily uh, in such a sense that birds of the same feather uh, fly together. Uh, so this perhaps is true for, for social context. If you cite each other, then perhaps you work in the same space, for example, but this is fun. But the assumption that uh, structural connectivity implies uh, representation similarity is fundamentally wrong in chemical modeling because your, your carbon and oxygen might not look like each other for them to be, be bonded. And yet another uh, pathology of GNN is that no more than GNN that people use, no wise fellow layman GNN, GNN can tell these two graphs apart because it, it, it's local, it only looks at its neighbors and it doesn't have the global uh, reception field to realize something as simple as uh, ring size. So what should we do about this? And uh, this is one attempt that uh, we proposed. So if you replace all of your point masses in your GNNs with uh, random variables under some tractable or untractable distribution, then this mean aggregator will suddenly become a lot more uh, expressive. So if you have three things that look like each other and you average them, that's the same as if you were to have two things and average them. However, if you have three random variables and do the same, it's going to be di different. So if you characterize the Dirichlet energy, um, which is just a measure of how similar your nodes will be after several rounds of message passing, you can theoretically prove and experimentally show that if you use any distribution other than deterministic, you're going to delay the uh, the decay of Dirichlet energy. In other words, you're going to delay uh, the 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 process of nodes starting to look sim similar to each other drastically. And this is especially useful for, for chemical modeling. And we have uh, uh, some, some experiments uh, on that. Uh, however, this, this study is not complete yet. And we attempted to submit this to uh, ISML, but uh, it has been rejected. Uh, but we're keeping working on, on this. So with that terrible disappointment, uh, that's all of my thesis. <laughs> I'd like to Thanks everybody again for, for coming. Those of you who have heard this a million times and those of you who might not know uh, what, what all this is about. Uh, thank you both. And yeah, uh, uh, for questions. Thank you. Incidentally, DeepMind's solution, or that was worse than your solution to that problem. Oh, right. Yeah.
All right, so I'm supposed to ask on Olivier's behalf for questions from not the committee at this point. Any questions from not the committee? The committee will later join by a separate Zoom. Anything at all? Um, so can you, can you go back to the slide um, about the, the tick two system? Yep. That you were you parameterized just? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so you said you parameterized just the ligand area. Oh, that, sorry, just the just, ligand. Just the ligand. Just okay. the ligand, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, it, it's not it's not a design choice. And right. uh, if we had the, the means, we would just parameterize the right. character, yeah. including the water. But uh, the, the thing is that we just do not have the software infrastructure to to do that jointly. So currently, this particular result is uh, resulting from only parameterizing the ligand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, cool. Yeah. If you go back to the side where you have like the two poles, one is stock A, one is one, and you're sort of drawing arrows between them. Mm -hmm. I think it's for the end, actually. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. The, um, you actually have to oh, but with, the, uh, with two more arrows. Oh, yeah. okay. Got it. Yes. Yeah. So um, this idea of constraining key geometry, mm -hmm. um, I'm very curious, like, do you create a mechanism for the model to learn what is the key geometry to be constrained? Oh, right. So uh, sorry, I should, should have clarified. So the, what I mean is that there have been work out there, and I think it's the, it's the right direction to move the beach to have expert hand code what geometry are never ever going to change. Or roughly in the in the course of the simulation, and in, in the event of like a bond might break or not during the simulation, you can have the model learn that. Yeah. So, so for example, they also that paper by uh, Juan et al. 2022, they also uh, benchmarked on the uh, walking person challenge. So they hypothesized that your arm and leg are gonna not gonna fall apart when you walk. And any other distance, for, for example, from your head to your toe, whatever, they can change. So they constrain a bit, or like constrain them as a, as a harmonic bond as we do, and then they they let the rest of rest of the distance to be inferred. So that, that that's uh, what I was trying to propose. I think think it's a it's a clever solution in in, in the sense that uh, this has been done by computational biophysicists for a long time, where they constrain, they input their knowledge in part of the uh, system. They believe that it's never going to change. Yeah, so I guess what I'm asking is, like, is there some sort of intermediate between um, having something be fully constrained and, like, maybe there's an added model that is the surrogate for the expert mm -hmm. who didn't have expert knowledge, and, like, there's some sort of threshold where you say, well, like, I'm just going to and for the expert and say this part won't actually move. Mm -hmm. One model is only trained on figuring out what's been trained as a sort of simulation. Yeah, I think it's just the balance between like how much knowledge you will uh, get uh, your need from humans and how much freedom you, yeah. you you give the model. So more freedom means that you'll have more you'll have more resolution, more flexibility. But again, this might have the risk of like it will give you totally unphysical uh, predictions. So one anecdote is that uh, Josh, when he ran uh, any on his system, discovered that when you collapse everything to zero, like everything is centered on zero, 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 so the entire thing should explode and the universe should like, I don't know, that thing will have given you a minima <laughs> in, uh, in any potential. So you'll have uh, physical things like that if you don't have constraints. Yeah. I can. Yes, I have a question for the last part. Kind of like slide 45 or 46. Oh, wow. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, for like drug discovery, it's all mm -hmm. um, how, how deep do we need to go to get better accuracy? Mm -hmm. That's one. Like, what, what is your thought? Mm -hmm. And second is um, by introducing noise, does that mean that you're like, um, Generalizing the model better. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, so first of all, I think it depends on like what feature you input to your your model. So, as we know, ring size is very important for for chemical modeling, of course. But there are a class of GNS that just cannot uh, realize ring size, and there is another class that 
cannot uh, can only realize rings that when your depths are uh, over a certain threshold. So if we want to model long range interaction in chemical modeling, then of course you need a deeper model. But the problem with GNN is the deeper model will also cause you a lot of trouble. So yeah, currently the, the practice that people usually just constrain your model to two to four layers, uh, which which is not which is not good because we just don't have means to to uh, get rid of all of those pathologies. But with the uh, but with the new framework that's not just point mass convolution, perhaps we can go a lot deeper. And for the second question. Yes, noise does regularize. That's one thing we know about noise. But in this case, it's not just uh, about regularization. So if you corrupt the, the input feature only and your coordinates, that's what the DeepMind paper did. That's the regularizer. But we also show that in this paper, uh, in this re rejected paper rather, it, it, it can also have another set of very nice theoretical properties. That not, that's not just the regularization. For example, it would delay the uh, decrease of traditional energy. Uh, this is just very simple. Um, it, it's Jensen's it's inequality, uh, basically. You have a more noise than your expectation of this traditional thing because it's kind of, kind of it's going to be uh, delay. It's going to be decreasing a lot slower. And that's one thing. The second thing is that because you have these kind of uh, degenerate algebra in your point methods. If you use random variables instead, it's not going to be degenerate anymore. So it actually affords you more uh, more expressiveness. So if you if you just use point methods, then it's theoretically shown that for in the, on the continuous space, you need at least n aggregators. And by aggregators, it means mean sum and the moment of the set to distinguish at most n elements. Whereas if this thing is stochastic, you only need one. Yeah, so it's not it's it's beyond the regularization. Yeah. Okay, I think we should close the public portion. And so let's thank Yuan Ching again. Thank you. We're gonna Good log talk. out thank of you. this Zoom. Log on to the other Zoom um, for uh, the so, private. So, so quickly, uh, Faye and Olivia, I think you have received the an invite. The, the invite for the secret portion, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll take two minutes and do that. And if you want to take a high break, now's the time. Okay. Okay.